uh, together. And we will be reading verses 1 through 8 again. And we will be emphasizing verse 2, 3, 4, and also we will look to verse 15 as well. But let's begin reading in verse number 1, Mark chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were baptized of him in river in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair, with a girdle of skin about his loins. He did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoe I'm, I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Let's go to verse 14 and 15 and read these two verses. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word this morning. Thankful, Father, that it has the power to save to the uttermost. Pray, dear Lord, today that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive, uh, and faith to act upon your word this morning. God, help us as we uh, look into this truth this morning of the gospel and that the call and the urgency to action for sinners to repent. And as we look at the doctrine of repentance this morning, I pray, Heavenly Father, that every one of us will repent of whatever it is in our lives that is unpleasing to Thee, Father. Help us to recognize that we are a needy people standing in need of Your grace and mercy that You so willingly and freely extend to us each and every day Father, help us to see the reality of ourselves. We need a reality check, dear God. And I pray, Lord, you'd show us today. Give us those things we stand in need of, and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are looking at the messenger of the gospel. You remember last week, as we looked at verses 2 and 3, that we looked at the message of the gospel in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we begin to deal with this messenger of the gospel, John the Baptist, who is a forerunner of Christ, who was an unusual man that ate unusual food, that had unusual clothing, that had an unusual message. This baptism of repentance, and that he came preaching repentance. And uh, we, we looked instantly at verse 2. He says, prepare thy way, prepare your way. And then he says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So we looked at last week that there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. We need to get out of our way and get in the way of the Lord. And it, that's the message of the gospel is that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, yet God sent His darling Son to die for our sins, to pay that price, and that if we'll repent and believe the gospel, we can be saved. It's really that simple. But as we look at more of this message of the message of the gospel today, we need to emphasize this word repentance. And so repentance is almost a forgotten thing in our day. In the early 90s, during what they would call the, the church growth movement, when churches began to really grow and build and people started coming real actively in the 90s, that Lifeway and other places would put out this ABCs of salvation. Admit you're a sinner. 
believe on Jesus and confess and call out to God, you'll be saved. The problem is no repentance. I can admit I'm a sinner and not be sorry for my sin. I can admit, hey, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Everybody does it. But there's no repentance from that sin. So I want us to see that as John came on the scene preaching repentance, John's in prison. Jesus comes. He picks up where John the Baptist leaves off and he preaches repentance. In the book of Acts, the message is repent and believe the gospel. You get into the the epistles. It's repent and believe the gospel. And you get to the book of Revelation and it gives us the last word to the church in the last days. It ain't look up. It's repent. It's repent. Mindful in these last days, Jesus reminded us because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And as we begin to think about this urgency of this need for what repentance is, I want us to really look at it. You see in verse 4 that John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. We see our word, this baptism of repentance. John called for something radical in his preaching. Baptism was alluded to Gentiles who had become proselytes to the Judaism of their day is that you had to become a Jew to be saved and they were convincing Gentiles that you, we have circumcision as our covenant for you Gentiles y'all need to get baptized to identify with our covenant and so they bat- only Gentiles got baptized but here comes John the Baptist and he's commanding these Jews to be baptized well we're not going to do that we're not Gentiles we, Abraham's our father okay so we don't need to be baptized and John's reminding them hey listen boys just because you're a Jew don't mean you're automatically saved and so you need to identify with Christ you need to identify with those misfit Gentiles because you're just as big a sinner as they are and so repentance is something that has lost its meaning as a lot of words have in our day world has changed the meaning. Preachers have changed the meaning. Churches have changed the meaning. They've watered down the gospel to make it appealing to unregenerate carnal men that's unsaved. So I can get in without turning from my sin. The problem of our day is people want to go to heaven when they die. They want to escape hell. They just don't want to give up their sins. And repentance is the Greek word metanoia. That you find in verse 15 when Jesus said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye. It's a command, not an invitation. You repent and believe the gospel. That word repent is metanoia. And it means to turn from sin and turn to the Savior. It's a positive and a negative. The negative, you are wrong and you need to turn. We are wrong and we need to turn. And then it also has the idea of to change one's mind. That's what repentance means. We came into this world thinking wrong. That's why we're told over and over again, put the, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Renew your mind. Have your thing right. You need to get your mind right. And, and repentance is saying, hey, this is wrong and God says it's wrong. So I don't need, I need to turn. I need to turn. As we looked last week from Luke 3, and as, what do we do? The people said, what do we do? He said, if you got two coats, give to the man that ain't got a coat. And if you don't want to, guess what? The axe gets laid to the root of the tree. Amen. That's what it says. And then he come on down and he says, the soul of the, the tax collectors, the public, he said, what shall we do? He says, quit robbing people. And if you don't want to do that, the root, hey, the axe is getting laid to the root of the tree. And then the soldier says, what are we going to do? He says, listen, do violence to no man, quit false and accuse the people, and be content with your wages. And if you don't want to repent, the, the axe gets laid to the root of the tree. You don't, if you want to go to hell, then absolutely nothing. If you want Christ, 
hell. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to help us this morning because there's so much junk that has gone through America and through our world. And so much has crept in unawares, as Jude says, is that repentance is still essential and necessary to be saved. And repentance is not a one-time deal. It ain't like I got the flu shot and glad that's over. You continue to repent every day. And so there's a lot of stuff we need to say about repentance. I've mentioned already the meaning of repentance. In Scripture, it's always turning from the negative and turning to the positive. Sin satisfied us at lost people to a degree, right? It gave us pleasure for a season. But soon after a while, that pleasure wore off and we found ourselves wanting and found ourselves unsatisfied. But there came a good glad day the Holy Ghost came our way uh, convicted us of our sin, showed us our lostness, and the moment we turned to Christ, we were satisfied with Christ. Christ is enough. He satisfies and He saves. And He has this salvation, satisfaction guarantee that everybody that comes to Christ will find satisfaction in Him. So repentance is always involved turning from the this and turning to Him. And so there comes this misunderstanding about Repentance. As I said, we can admit that we are sinners without turning from that sin. Do you know that the Bible exclusively lists things that if our lifestyles are characterized by, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Did y'all know that? Two, two times. In 1 Corinthians 6 and in Galatians 5, there is a list of sins and He not only says those things, and He says such as these. I may not have named them all, but anything that fits this bill, if your life is characterized by this, you can be sure you're unconverted. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 9. And you know to understand, he mentions this idea. He doesn't mention the word repentance, but he does mention that we were like this, meaning there had been a change, a turning in our lives, that we are no longer in that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So let's talk about unrighteous. Who is unrighteous? Everybody. Every one of us in and of ourselves is unrighteous and we don't have enough righteousness in us to save ourselves. So reality, nobody that has never been saved and has the imputed righteousness of Christ on your life is inheriting the kingdom of God. And that Paul is saying now, and this is what the unrighteous do, this is what is characterized by their lifestyle, and all of us that have been redeemed by the grace of God will identify with them. And then he uses the next three words, be not deceived. Don't be deceived by this. He says neither fornicators. What is a fornicator? It is a sexual immoral. It is anybody that has sex outside of marriage. That's what a fornicator is. If you have a lifestyle of laying up with your uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, and shacking up and sharing the same bed and have sexual relations before the marriage altar, that's what a fornicator is. If your life is characterized by fornication, you can be sure you're not going to heaven when you die. That's what the book says. It's impossible to be a fornicator and keep on fornicating and not repent from that and go to heaven when you die. I didn't write it, God did. You have to take that up with Him. And then He says, nor idolaters. Now what is an idolater? It is Somebody that worships anybody or anything above Jesus Christ. In our day, it's 
so much as people's worshiping this false image of Jesus. These false Jesuses. These false Christs that these false prophets preach. Not the Jesus of the Bible. They idolate them. I mean, you can idolize anybody or anything. And the Bible says, they that fornicate, they that are idolaters, are inheriting the kingdom of God. Said thirdly, nor adulterers. Now, adulterers are those that are married and have we would say physical relations outside of marriage, but Jesus heightens it, doesn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount. If we look at the opposite sex and we're married and have lust in our heart, what did Jesus say? We've committed adultery already. Yeah, you see, the, the, the impossibility that Jesus is putting on, you need Christ. You need to quit trusting in yourself to get you to heaven. You need to quit trusting in your religion to get to heaven. You need Jesus because all of us is in a bad way right now. You see that? He's putting us all in the same boat. We all are the righteous. None of us can live up to this in and of ourselves. This is the stipulations he's putting on it. He leaves no stone unturned. And then he says, no element. Boy, isn't this a word for the day? Does anybody know what ethyl means? It means for men to be soft. It means men to be sissies. And I'm going to go ahead. It means for men to be homosexual. It means men home to be women. And for, listen, I'm a brother Paul Washer, man. If you find your feminine side, you better crucify it. I mean, Paul, I mean, he's not believing enough. Then he says, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. People abusing themselves with other people with mankind. I mean, that, is that not what? There's substance abuse, right? Going around, everybody getting drunk and stoned out of their mind. You hear me? All these flat parties and all this other stuff. And, and then it, it just keeps, the list goes on and on and on. Then verse 10, nor thieves. Nobody that steal, makes a lifestyle of thievery, stealing, nor covetousness. What's covetousness? Wanting what other people have. nor drunkards, nor revilers. These rebels, that's what revile is. You constantly antagonize people. You, you constantly just at them and you're picking at them and picking at them. And boy, you just keep on and keep on. It's what I call pot stirs. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We go to work every day and we know we've already got a mark. They come in with a boat paddle and they just love to stir the pot. That's what a revival is. They love trouble. And they love to keep trouble stirred. Then, he says, nor extortioners. People that are scamming people today, listen, that's an epidemic. Calling. Y'all that work in the banks, y'all know about it. Hey man, these people got me. They cleaned out my, yeah, you gave them the information. There's nothing we can do for you. They're extortioners. And then you got tax collectors that are extorting our money. There's an extent that taxation, as much as we do, has become theft. Thefts. And he says, these people are not, listen to what he says in verse 10, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This lifestyle doesn't, I don't care how many times they walked the aisle. I don't care how many times they prayed the sinner's prayer. I don't care how many times they got dunked in the baptismal pool. If their life is characterized as they are L-O-S-T lost. God's word says so. But I love verse 11. Praise God. Listen, buddy, you would have known me before 2006. I fit the bill for Verses 
mercy letter. And such were past tense. Some of you. Woo! Thank God God's grace is greater than our sin. Thank God no matter how lost we were, how condemned we were, God's grace is greater than our sin. Thank God God's able to say to the other folks, there's hope for you, sinner boy, sinner girl, sinner man, sinner woman. Jesus is able to save. He's able to wash. And such were some of you. He says, but you wash. You've been clean. You've been regenerated. You've been made a new creature. And it says, but ye are sanctified. You've been set apart. But ye are justified, declared righteous <laughs> in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. That's a wonderful blessing, beloved. But you see, God came to you like you were. But he didn't leave you like he found you. <laughs> Listen. There was a moment in time when you got sanctified by the Spirit of God. You repented. You turned from that and you ran to Jesus. Yes, and that's you're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Repentance led to faith. Faith brought on justification. And now, glory to God, we're declared righteous in the courtroom of heaven. Hallelujah. But there was some repentance. You were like this, but you ain't like this no more. You see that? Such were some of you. Galatians 5, I'll give you almost the ideal same list. And for time's sake, I won't go there. We got the gist of it. If you're living however you want to live, and doing your own thing with your own life, you've yet to repent. I don't get to do what I want to do. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Look down here at verse 19 of chapter 6 before we leave there. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For you've been bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. It ain't my body, my choice. Are you listening to me? It ain't what I want to do. It's what God wants. And if we got to do what glorifies God, don't do what makes you happy. Do what glorifies God. People got this misunderstanding about repentance. Repentance means, hey, I deny myself. I take up my cross and I follow Jesus. That's what repentance looks like. So let's talk about this misunderstanding real quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation but not to be repented of, and worldly sorrow worketh death. There's, so what do you mean by, what does he mean by that? There's two kinds of sorrow. Many people just because somebody cries means they repented. No. Repentance ain't when you cry, it's when you change. Esau and Judas both wept after their sins. But the Bible says of both of them, neither one of them found a place of repentance. Godly sorrow that leads to salvation, that brings about repentance, it breaks a man's heart and he is contrite in spirit as David was in Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. There's a brokenness over sin. There's a hatred for sin. And therefore we don't want to sin. We don't like to sin. But we live in a society that, that thinks sin's not no big deal anymore. And when you call them out on it, they start weeping and crying. They're weeping and crying because they got caught, not because they regretted what they did. Amen. That's the difference between godly sorrow that leads to salvation and this worldly sorrow that 
works death. This worldly sorrow is I'll fake them out. And to make them think I repented, I don't regret what I did. I love what I did. I just hate they found out about it. You'd be surprised how that goes in churches. And pastors getting caught up in scandals. Uh-oh. They cry the tears. Say what you want to hear, but they ain't sorry. They done what they done. They, they, they sorry they got caught. They really didn't change. They want to make you think they change. But we live in a very... Day. That's why Paul would say, let no man deceive you by any means. Let them, no man deceive you. In the last days, there's going to be characterized by false prophets with a false gospel, with a false Christ that's going to doom people's soul to hell. And it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that God's going to send strong delusion that they would believe a lie that their souls might be damned because they did not believe the truth. Ain't no way. God would do something like that. Well, you, yes, and you better get your mind fixed on that real quick because the book says God's going to do that. Not Satan, not man, but God sending strong delusion. And do you want to know something other else about these false prophets? Jude says they were before of old ordained by God to this condemnation. God allows, listen to me, y'all look up in here just a little bit. God allows false prophets to purge the church. To separate the sheep from the goats. To get the wheat from the tares and the wheat from the chaff. I, listen, you, you can't argue with the fact that book says God has allowed this to happen. And in these last days, Jesus will not come except there come a falling away first. And it's happening. Churches are running preachers out of town nowadays. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? The devil ain't fighting the church. He's joining the church. He's putting men in pulpits. And there's fewer and fewer men that'll stand and preach the book like it is anymore. Boy, it tears me up to think how many people even in North Mississippi as much gospel preaching has been done don't know enough God, enough gospel to recognize the difference between what's real and what ain't. Listen, repentance is something these false teachers ain't going to talk about. It's something that is foreign from their lifestyle. It's something that's misunderstood. And I would also say this. Both John the Baptist and Jesus in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew and Luke give us this account that if you want to be baptized, you need to show me fruits, meat for repentance. <laughs> So in other words, if you want to be baptized, what they tell us in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist called the Pharisees a brood of idols. Who's told y'all to flee from the wrath to come? And he says, if y'all want to be baptized, you show me fruits meet for repentance. Repentance produces fruit. Going back to last week, the Thy way, the way, what do we do? They get it, and what, this is what you do. If you don't, the axe gets laid to the root of the trees. Do you, do you understand that? The reality is repentance, and this is what repentance does. It produces a changed life. Amen. You show me there's a change in you. And if you've been born again, there will be a change in you. You'll become a new creature. And so let me get to the third and final thing this morning. There is the must of repentance. Jesus said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. John the Baptist was preparing the way of Jesus to come the first time. And now we're preparing the people for Jesus to come again and our message hasn't changed. It's still repent and believe the gospel because 
because Jesus is coming again. The must of repentance. There is this command to repent in Mark 1.15. Go back to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 verse 15. You, you see the command clear as day. The Bible says in saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You, you see that is a command. It's an imperative. It's a call to action. You repent. You believe the gospel because the kingdom of God is at hand. The Son of God is here. He's coming to live a perfect life. Die in our place on Calvary. Going to be buried and raised again the third day. And He's going to send up on high. And then He's coming again. You need to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus is our only hope, boys. Jesus and what He's accomplishing on that cross is going to satisfy the demands of God. And it's going to be the only way a man can be right with God. So repent. Believe the gospel. John the Baptist preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. All through the book of Acts, you'll find in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Same message that John the Baptist preached. And then you find further in the book of Acts, Acts 8.22, he preached repentance. Uh, Acts 17.30 at Mars Hill when they were worshiping uh, this unknown God. Paul says, I'm here to tell you about it. And he says, God used to wink at this ignorance. But now He commands all men everywhere to repent. And then you get in Acts 26.20 and it says the Gentiles should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now why over and over do we find this, this idea of fruits meet for repentance? Talk's cheap. Talk is cheap. I can talk a good talk all day long, but those that repent, they'll walk the walk. They may stumble and fall along the way, but they're not going to stay down. They're going to repent and get right with Jesus. But beloved, Titus chapter 1 verse 16 has a warning for us. They profess to know God, but by their works they deny Him, being an abominable and destitute, and He says reprobate. Everybody we talk to in North Mississippi is saved. Am I telling you right? Well, I, 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 and then you talk, are you saved? Well, I go to church. That ain't what I asked you. There's a bunch of people going to hell from the church view. There's a free bunch of preachers going to hell that's been preaching in pulpits a whole lot. I'm just telling you. That's facts. You are not saying that. I did not say that. They talk a good talk. They ain't going to walk in no walk. You don't do what I do. You do as I say, not as I do. How many times have you heard a preacher tell you that? I've heard it a bunch in my life. <laughs> God help us. The reality is, talk is cheap. Jesus said, there's going to be a mom many come to me, Lord, and we're not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wondrous works, and he's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. That, that's, that's terrifying to some people. James says, what does it profit if a man say he hath faith, and he don't have works? Can that man's faith save him? Faith works. Read Hebrews 11. By faith, so and so sit on a pew. Oh no. By faith, so and so did this. By faith, so and so did. Faith in the God of the impossibility calls people to action. Jane Daniel says, They that know their God will be strong and do exploits. They won't bow to wicked government officials. They won't bow the knee to rebellious leaders. They'll stand and face the lions then. They'll stand and face the pirate. If you know God, it don't matter what man do. We're living in a day. We're finding out who's for who. Which side are you on this morning? It's repent and believe the gospel. I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. James says if you believe in God, y'all do as well. The demons also believe and tremble. 
But don't say you believe and your life ain't characterized by what the book says a believer's life should be. People don't like James, but James is clarifying this idea. This whole easy believe is from one, two, three, repeat after me that America's been indoctrinated with. You can come to Jesus and keep your sin and your life remain unchanged. That's foreign language to the Bible. Jesus calls for radical transformation. Radical change. The days that are characterized by the last days, men shall be lovers of pleasure. More than lovers of God. That's why the church house has been abandoned and neglected. People love themselves more than they love God. They love their recreation and they love their pleasure more than they love God. I wonder how many of us are going to have to repent because, oh, how I love Jesus. It should be, oh, how I used to love Jesus. Oh, me. What are the consequences then of not repenting? Of not coming to this doctrine of repentance. It's real simple. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13, 5, He told them, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And the idea is if you don't turn from yourself, from your sin, and from this society you live in, and if you don't turn to me, you're going to perish. And he ain't talking about physical death. He's talking about eternal punishment and hellfire. It's repent or perish. So everybody knows that repentance is necessary to be a believer. But most another thing about the misconception, they think repentance is just for lost people. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Boy, my heart's heavy when I read this verse this week. First Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must first begin where? In the house of God. Huh? That judgment must first begin in the house of God. And if it shall begin at us, what shall be the end of them that not only believe, but obey the gospel of God? The time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God. When God chooses to judge a nation... The first fact of judging is going where? The church. Do y'all not see the judgment of God in our day? Or what God's given to be preachers in our day? And what we call church is so far in the biblical Christian. Community centers. Country clubs. Activity centers. Remove the pulpit from the platform. Drama teams have taken the place of preaching. Are y'all listening to me? The Word of God is being pushed out and we want all this other stuff. We just had all this preaching. The time has come men will no longer endure sound doctrine. But they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So when a preacher keeps striking a nerve, it's time for him to go. And we're going to get somebody that's going to preach smooth things to us. We're going to preach those things that are tickle our ears. That's the judgment of God. When God gives you what you want, that's not a good thing. And we're seeing God just turn it all over. He sings, He took his hand off and he says, Here, y'all know I'm going to give you what you want. God help us. Save us from this. So there's no way it could possibly happen to us. Let me tell you, let me just say, we're going to be here just a few more moments. All through the Bible, God commands individuals to repent. All men everywhere to repent. Amen. That includes me. That includes you. All men. He calls individuals to repent. Number two, He calls for cities to repent. He calls for nations to repent. 
And the last thing that he does in Revelation 2 and 3, he calls the church to repent. And I want us to look at Revelation chapter 2 real quickly. Verse 1 through 5. had a great beginning. Timothy pastored Ephesus. Paul started Ephesus. I mean, they had the Apostle Paul started. Timothy come along, pastored there. But listen to what it says in verse 1 of Revelation 2. What I love about Revelation chapter number 1, we find Christ walking in the midst of His church. I'm thankful for the presence of Almighty God. I'm glad God knows where we're at. And that could be a blessing and it could be a bad thing because God knows everything about us that we don't want nobody else knowing about us. He sees all. He knows all. He's, he's actively involved with His church. And it says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And according to Revelation 1, the seven golden candlesticks are churches. <laughs> Praise God. Verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. Boy, well, they got some commendable things. They're working. They're laboring. The word labor means to work to the point of exhaustion. They're giving out in their labor. And then he says in thy patience, which is endurance. Y'all just keep keep going. Y'all like to energize your money. You just keep going and going. You, you're sticking with it. You're staying by the stuff. You're steadfast. I mean, praise God, if you lived in Ephesus, you would want to be a member of the church of Ephesus. And how thou canst bear them which are evil. Listen, they didn't tolerate no nonsense in the church. You live in a wicked lifestyle and profess to be saved, they're going to make you 18 with you. They went to you. You wouldn't listen. They went with two or three witnesses. You wouldn't listen. They put you for the church. They just put you out if you wasn't going to change. That's a lost thing today. Let's go. We can't afford to lose nobody. We can't afford to keep unrepentant people here. <laughs> Either you got to get in or you got to get out. And if you think people will not repent, God's going to move His preacher and His people out of them places. Amen. Facts. He says, you can't bear them which are evil and has tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. So there was people coming along saying they were apostles. They belong to Jesus. No, you're not. I mean, bless God, they were strong. They knew what they believed, why they believed it. They could identify what was real, what was not real. They could identify who God's man was and who God's man was. Praise God. I mean, hey, that's what we want in a church, right? Verse 3, and has borne, you, you bore these heavy burdens, you've had patience, and for my name's sake has labored and not fainted. Y'all ain't quitting. Y'all sticking by the stuff. And I say, hey, hey, every one of us say, praise God, that's the kind of church I want to be part of. But what did Jesus have to say about the church? He said these good things about it, but look at verse 4. Nevertheless, all this good is made obsolete because of this. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou has left, abandoned your first love. It means the honeymoon's over. You don't love Jesus like you used to. You don't read the Bible like you used to. You don't pray like you used to. You don't go to church like you used to. Are y'all listening to me this, this afternoon? Well, we passed noon now. Do you understand? Are you more in love with Jesus now than you was the day that He saved you? And if you're not, we need to repent. We let troubles and church hurt take away our love for Jesus. Jesus didn't hurt you. The evil, unrepentant people in them pews hurt you. Not Jesus. And somehow or another through life and the trials we went through, we've let those things affect our love for Jesus and we have cooled off and we have left our first love. Church is no more a joy. It's a dread and it's a duty and we're just going through the motions. That's what leaving your first love looks like. 
The greatest commandment in all the world is to do what? Love God with everything you have. All your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And every one of us fell at that every day. Amen. And so if that is the greatest command, wouldn't the greatest sin be not loving Jesus like we ought to? We can be so adamant about being right in our doctrine. We're wrong in our devotion. We're so adamant of bless God. We're Bible believers and this is why. But you don't love Jesus like you used to. And Jesus said that don't mean a hill of beans. Because Paul says if I have all gifts to do all these great things. If I give my body to be burned and I have not charity, which is love, it profits me. If I'm not in love with Jesus, I'm wasting my time. If I'm not here for Jesus, I'm wasting my time. If I don't worship because I love Jesus, we're wasting our time. If we're not excited about Jesus down for our sins, we're wasting our time. And Jesus has a great problem with people that will be right doctrinally but be wrong devotionally. He says, you've left me. You've left your first love. The main thing stopped being the main thing. We have a relationship with Jesus. And guess what happens? When that relationship with Him is wrong, we're wrong on every other relationship. Oh, God. And listen to what he says in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Remember the time and place where you in love, where you in love with Jesus. And remember those days. Remember. And then next, notice what he says. And repent. Because guess what? Who's moved? Who's changed? Me. You, God's right where we left Him. We need to repent. We need to turn and go back. And then He says this, and do the first works. So start back doing what you were doing when you first got saved. Are y'all listening to this? Hey, then that is what true repentance is when you get back to doing what you know you ought to be doing. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This next part of this verse terrifies me. And he says, or else. Repent, remember, repent, and repeat your first works, or else. This is God's ultimatum. Either you remember, you repent, and you return to me, or else. Or else what? I will come unto thee quickly. And this ain't talking about his second coming or the rapture. He's talking about, I'm coming to get you. This is a good visit. I'm not coming to comfort, I'm coming to chasten you. I'm coming to correct. This is what he says. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. What's that even mean? God takes their ability to exist and their influence away from them and he shuts the light off. And it just becomes Ichabod that. What happens when God turns the light off? His man and his people because there's no light. What does this Bible say about light? The Word of God is the light. God will remove this and give people exactly what they want. No book. No preacher. Ceases to exist. It's saying God's church ain't in trouble. I beg to differ. 
There's no church guaranteed permanent existence. He can close down any place that refuses to repent. God would close a church down that was so orthodox, so right in doctrine, but the one thing they're guilty of, God says, I'll shut you down. Yeah, if you don't love me, all this other stuff you got in your credentials ain't worth a hill of beans. Because if you don't love me, you're not loving your community. And you're not loving people. I don't know about you. I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know what to do if there wasn't a cornerstone there. We started good. I want to finish well. But we need a reality check. Do you love Jesus like you want to? And if not, repent or you could come to life. Let's stand up. Father, God in heaven, we need your help this morning. God, I recognize and realize the greatness of the truth of God's Word and the great need for repentance. We're a wicked people, God. We're a lazy, indifferent, cold people. We're so used to our routine, our methods, and our motions, and God, we just need you. We've drifted from you. We need to return to you. God, would you bring repentance to us? Because, God, I don't want the light to go out. I don't want this place to cease to exist or no longer have influence in the place you've put it. Father God in heaven, would you examine ourselves as we come to the Lord's table. Help us to get right, get cleaned up, and get ready to observe the Lord's Supper. God, do a work in our hearts and lives, and we'll give you glory for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As she plays, you come.